Um, this work has been produced by an ex-UN worker from human rights who worked in human rights for 12 years. So I'm actually presenting this on her behalf today. And I'm presenting from our network, EURAS, of which I'm the Secretary General, which is Europe Against Drugs, soon to be Europe for Action on Drugs. And we are a drug demand reduction NGO network based in Brussels. And we are very pleased to announce that Turkish Green Crescent recently joined our network. Um, and we're very glad to have them on board. They are the first member organization that we have from Turkey. So URAD, uh, we mainly advocate for drug policies which are focused around prevention and recovery. So we have many NGOs on the ground at grassroots level, such as San Patrignano. You may have heard their presentation earlier today. And also uh, Celebrate Recovery, who presented yesterday. I'm also, we're also members of the EU Civil Society Forum on Drugs, and I'm the vice chair of that group. And we're an ECOSOC registered NGO. And we are one of the only drug, well, we are the only drug policy network based in Brussels. So we have quite good connection to European institutions, for example. So today I will do a background about the various human rights frameworks, how human rights applies to various elements of drug policy, examples of how human, right law, human rights laws can be violated, and we finish with some recommendations. So when we talk about human rights, very often what we're talking about are the various international covenants on human rights as well as the various treaties which countries can choose to opt into. So for example, there's different treaties, for example, for migrant workers, um, for example. And this is a map of uh, how many uh, treaties on human rights the different countries have actually ratified. So for your interest, Turkey have actually ratified 16 human rights uh, treaties. Um, compared to, for example, the UK, they have signed 13, Belgium have signed 17, and sort of at the lower end of the scale, the USA, who have ratified nine, uh, Iran, who have ratified seven, and China, who have ratified nine. But when we talk about how drug policy relates to human rights, drugs is actually um, only mentioned in really one human rights convention, that's the rights of the child in Article 33. Apart from, of course, the UN drug control conventions themselves. In the drug control conventions, they don't actually encourage states, and this is a very important thing to mention, is that the Drug conventions do not encourage states to take measures that would violate human rights. A blanket sort of incarceration of drug users is also not encouraged under the international drug conventions by UNODC or by the INCB. But, it, but the conventions do talk about sanctions, but it clearly states that these sanctions could also equate to drug treatment. So some people blame or like to blame the drug control conventions for breaches in human rights. But what we want to show you today is on a legal standpoint, what sort of violations um, there may be in drug policy um, and whose responsibility they are. So I'm now gonna go through a short list of different types of human rights which could apply quite closely to drug policy. The first one is the rights of children. So in all actions con con concerning children, the best interests of the child should always have the primary consideration. So for example, if the child has infringed a penal law, they should be treated in a manner that's consistent with the promotion of the child's sense of dignity and their reintegration into society. So potential violations, you know, you could argue could be like a lack of drug services for children who have drug problems. And you may think that this is only in sort of undeveloped countries where you don't have drug services for children. But for example, even in the UK, for the most marginalized drug users who may have very fragmented lives, may find themselves on the streets, there is actually no residential treatment for children at all under the age of 18. 
Um, other clear points of human rights violations would be, obviously, the death penalty should not be applied to children under any circumstance. And also, you have some human rights violations in regard to how children are incarcerated. The second right, which I'll talk about, is the, the right to life. Um, the death penalty is prohibited in countries where the optional protocol to the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights has been ratified and is not allowed to be used on children in any country. For countries which have not abolished the death penalty, the sentence of death may only be imposed for the most serious crimes. The drug offences do not meet this threshold. So uh, an area where you could have human rights action would be where you do see that the death penalty is being used for drug offences. Amnesty International, um, Human Rights Watch often document these um, quite graphically. Um, and this is one of the images that they use to show where the death penalty is being used in various countries. Um, from this diagram, you can see that we have the USA on one side and China on the other. Um, but we also have been seeing in the last few years some kind of worrying developments in countries like Iran. So in 2013, um, 687 people were executed through the use of the death penalty, which was a 16% increase on 2012 in one year. And possession and trafficking of narcotics remain a common charge amongst those people. Um, for example, there are other countries where we have issues with the death penalty, in countries where the death penalty is not allowed. So for example, even in the UK, you may have people who have been convicted of drug trafficking offences who are in a country where the death penalty still exists. So for example, there is a case at the moment where we, there is a lady called Lindsay Sandiford who was um, found guilty of drug trafficking offences in Indonesia. And she lost her appeal. And at the moment, it is very unclear of how she can actually um, follow through on another court case because she is not receiving any financial support to evade the death penalty. So there are also cases of extradition where the death penalty uh, does not exist. The third right that we'll talk about is the right to health care and to treatment. And this is in Article 12 of the International Covenant of Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. It requires states to recognize the right to health for all people. Um, the right to health contains freedoms and entitlements, including the right to be free from non-consensual medical treatment and to be free from torture, forced labor, solitary confinement, and treatment administered without consent may violate human rights laws. Um, and for one example of potential violations um, could be, for example, Human Rights Watch claimed that in, UK, in Ukraine, drug, drug users were actually facing arrest when they were going to drug treatment services. So this is one way where maybe you could argue that their human rights to healthcare was being clearly impeded um, by uh, in, an enforcement approach. The fourth right, which is clearly linked to drug policy, is the right to non-discrimination. And the principle of this is that all people should be equal in front of the law. And so there are two types of discrimination from a legal basis. There is direct discrimination, where there is less favorable treatment on bases such as race, gender, disability. And then there is indirect discrimination, uh, where a practice is neutral or appears to be neutral, but it impacts disproportionately on some people. So, for example, violations could be mandatory HIV testing, um, where it is not re required, or the misuse of stop and search powers. So, stop and search is a thing that's often used in the UK. The police can stop anyone and search them for possession of drugs. And this is very hard to say whether people are actually being discriminated against. So some people will say that this stop and search power um, discriminates on young people because the police use it on young people. But then 
uh, the biggest proportion of drug users are in these younger age groups. So it's quite hard on an individual level for something like stop and search for an individual to claim that they've been discriminated against if they're black or if, or if they're young. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to argue. And the last right that we're going to talk about is the right to a fair trial and to proportionate sentencing. So these are all things which, again, are embedded in law. So there are clear standards which relate to law enforcement as well as to sentencing. And so violations could be receiving disproportionate sentences or long minimum sentences, which are also disproportionate to the crime that has been committed. Um, so I can use some examples from the United States. Um, there have been some cases where if you do not plead guilty um, straight away, you, you could receive a sentence which was three times as long um, that should have been applied for that crime. So in cases where the evidence is not so strong, people actually may forgo a trial and plead guilty, perhaps if they're not guilty, because they're concerned that they may get a sentence that's three times as long. So this can impede a fair trial, you could argue. And in terms of proportionate sentencing, things like minimum sentences, um, for example, there are, are examples of people receiving four years in prison for possession of cannabis. Uh, you could argue that this is very disproportionate to the crime that was committed. And we are quite interested in our network in uh, models such as alternative incarceration. So you might have heard the presentation from Elisa Rubini on San Patrignano where they offer alternative incarceration. So this is for people who've committed other crimes um, not because of their drug possession, but they may have committed like burglaries and other non-violent crime which is related to their drug use. And they can then opt instead under Italian law to go to a rehabilitation center for uh, sentences up to three years in prison. So from this work, what we've developed is a, quite a substantial series of recommendations today. I've really only given you a summary of the work that we've conducted. Um, recommendations, for example, to support funding to the UN ODC for mo the monitoring of human rights violations, uh, for drug policies to reflect the, inter the international rights of children to be protected from drug use, and we've made quite a lot. So we will make these available to you in the paper that we've prepared for the symposium, uh, which will be printed after the conference. But I just want to end on what I think are quite crucial points, is that the international drug policy is very much wounded by episodic in some countries, and sparse, but also some very severe human rights violations but that these violations are not prescribed, condoned, or encouraged by the International Drug Control Conventions. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>